Let's get into the book of Isaiah. Last time we covered the uh, introduction and background notes. I'll try not to be repetitive. In fact, on the one hand, I like to take our time and we, really, you know, get into it. On the other hand, we want to keep an eye on the fact that Isaiah does consist of 66 chapters. So knowing that we have other goals besides the book of Isaiah, we'll, we'll take some portions and move right along stopping to probe those areas that are of particular interest to our own special orientation. So last time, if I'm correctly informed, we made it through chapter one. Is that right? And um, I thought we'd gotten a little further. That's why I was anticipating getting to chapter six tonight. But but, uh, we'll take it as it comes and see how it goes. Chapter two of Isaiah, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Again, remember his focus. His focus is on the southern kingdom, on the house of Judah, and very specifically the city of Jerusalem. Thirty different titles of Jerusalem are used in the book. And again, Amos has got nothing to do with the prophet Amos. It's a different word in the Hebrew. Both the first and last letters are different. Nothing to do with one another. It shall come to pass in the last days. Aha, see, here we have our attention. We sort of zoom through Isaiah, but when we get the last days or the latter days, we shift into first gear and pay more attention, don't we? Shall come to pass the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow unto it. Really? Has that ever happened? Will it happen? Hasn't happened yet. It will happen in the future. Isaiah will have a lot to say about this. One of the things that we will have hammered into us by the time Isaiah is through is that God is not through with Israel. God is going to rule the world from Jerusalem. Jesus Christ will assume the throne of David, and Isaiah says a great deal about that. And don't let anyone sell you the idea that that's an Old Testament idea superseded by the new. That's nonsense. The promise of Gabriel to Mary underscored that, that Jesus was to sit on the throne of David. He has not done that yet, yet he will. God has said it, and he will do it. In fact, one of the things you can do if you're taking notes is this would be normally a good time to deviate into Acts chapter 15. In the interest of time, we'll move on, but I'll just summarize what happens. In Acts 15, there's the famous Council of Jerusalem in which the issue that was being addressed was, does a Gentile have to become a Jew to be saved? It was some 20 years after God had opened the door to the Gentiles, that vision of, uh, with Peter and the sheet and all that. And still, after 20 years, they were running into this flack by the Judaizers that if a Gentile wanted to become a Christian, he had to become a Jew first. And Paul said, no way. And that became a big dispute. So they, he went to Jerusalem to get that resolved. I'm always amused because we always have that presented as if the council was determining the outcome. I don't read it that way. I think Paul would have gone on had they not agreed and done what he wanted to do anyway, knowing Paul. But clearly, they call it the Council of Jerusalem. And of course, Peter and James are dominant in that chapter where they defend the idea that a Gentile is not under the law. But what everybody misses in Acts 15 is a secondary issue that's really primary to them. The issue is, is if a Gentile does not have to become a Jew to be saved, what's to become of Israel? And at your leisure, if you read the speech by James, the brother of Christ, the leader of that council, he quotes from the Old Testament, and the specific thing, well, let's look at it. I've gone it this far. Acts 15, the council at Jerusalem, and I've summarized up to about verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto thee. Simeon hath declared how God first did visit the nations to take out a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophet, as it is written, After this I will return. After what? After what? After I call out a people from the nations for my name, see? And I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again its ruins and will set it up. The tabernacle of David, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord in all the nations, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the age. The point is, the secondary issue that we often miss when we go through Acts 15 is that God is not through with Israel. Anyone that has trouble with that idea should read Romans 9, 10, and 11, three chapters where Paul nails that home. But we'll move on. Back in Isaiah, verse 3, And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. 
and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This looks to a period when the world will be instructed from the temple, not the temple about to be built. First temple, Solomon's temple, second temple, sort of Zerubbabel's, then ultimately expanded by Herod, idiom called second temple. Third temple, presently underfoot, presently ready to be built, that's the one that the Antichrist will desecrate. It's the, what we might call the fourth temple, the next temple, the millennial temple that's being dealt with here. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and he shall rebuke many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. What a dream. That dream is emblazoned one on the UN and many buildings, as a dream of mankind. Will it be realized? Not until the Prince of Peace is running things, much as we'd like to think otherwise. It won't happen until then. Verse 5. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, house of Jacob, because they are filled with customs from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves, and the children of foreigners. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Now, as we read this, of course, Isaiah is talking about the idol-worshiping nations of that time. But as we read that, recognize that we are not excluded. Just because you don't have a carved image sitting on the mantle at home, I hope, <laughs> doesn't mean we are not guilty of worshiping the works of our fingers. It doesn't have to be a carved idol. It can be the space program. It can be our advances in science. Not that these are to be disparaged. Don't misunderstand me. But putting the works of man ahead of the works of the creator of man. That's what an idol is. Anything that gets between you and God is an idol doesn't have to be in the old-fashioned idioms. It can be in other forms. And uh, we see it right and left. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone who is proud and lofty, and upon everyone who is lifted up, for he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Well, that doesn't require much comment. It speaks for itself. In Isaiah's eloquence, it gets right to us. We understand what he's saying. But notice that the root of all sin is pride. What God hates is pride. When we get to Isaiah 14, we're going to discover the source of all evil, the Satan. And where did sin start? In his heart. With the five I wills, I will be like the Most High. The pride and the arrogance of Satan is at the root of all sin. That's why God hates pride. That's why God uses leaven as a symbol of sin, because it corrupts by puffing up. And that's exactly what pride does. Pride is the root of all sin. Yes, love of money, I understand. But the point is, is that you'll see all the way through the Scripture, if you're alert to it, you'll realize that God hates sin indeed, but very specifically, he hates, above all things, pride. And that will all be brought low. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the caves of the rocks, and into the holds of the earth, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Turn to Revelation 6, verse 16. 
I'm going to work very hard at not making this a study of the book of Revelation, but it won't be easy because you're going to discover that Isaiah and the book of Revelation are so intertwined. But just to refresh your memory on your review of the book of Revelation, you may recall in the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, 15, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains of the mighty men and every slave, so forth. They will hide themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne upon the wrath of the Lamb. Now, as you read that in the book of Revelation, the writer in the book of Revelation takes for granted that you have a command of the Old Testament. The reason Revelation is troublesome sometimes is because we haven't got a command of the Old Testament, but to the extent you have, it'll be familiar. And one of your most helpful books is Isaiah. Revelation speaks of the Holy Spirit as the seven spirits which are before his throne. That's a strange idiom to New Testament ears, except Isaiah chapter 11 explains that. You'll discover as you go through Isaiah, many of these idioms used in Revelation come out of the old 357 direct quotes in Revelation from the Old Testament, many of them from Isaiah. This particular verse, in back in Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, echoes, of course, in a sense, Revelation 6, 16. In fact, those of you that recall from our Joshua study know that the book of Joshua, while an absolutely accurate narrative, is also a model, a allegory, a foreshadowing of the book of Revelation in many ways. And even there, where Joshua, you know, Yoshua, to be Jesus in the Greek, leads God's chosen people to dispossess the land of his usurpers. He battles seven nations. Those nations ally themselves under Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, the false leader. And Joshua defeats him in Beth Horon, chapter 10, with signs in the sun and the moon. And the defeated kings hide in caves, saying, rocks fall on us in Joshua. So it's interesting. You'll study, the more you study Joshua carefully, the more you realize it anticipates structurally and idiomatically the book of Revelation. But we'll keep moving on. Verse 20. In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made, each one for himself, to worship to the moles and to the bats. I don't know why I pick on the bats, but anyway. To go into the clefts of the rocks and in the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So this is end time stuff. It's out of Revelation 6 and following. Say she from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? So that's Isaiah's second chapter. These early chapters in Isaiah are heavy-handed. Isaiah is calling to account the spiritual condition of Judah and Jerusalem, and he continues chapter 3. A whole national disintegration. Chapter 3, verse 1, 4. Behold, the Lord of hosts doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff and the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of the fifty, the honorable man, the counselor, the skillful craftsman, and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. I'm always fascinated. You find this several places in the Scripture that an idiom of the disintegration of the society as the children are running things. And the parents, if that makes you uncomfortable, it should. I don't have any answers. I'll keep moving. Anyway, verse 5. The people shall be oppressed, and every one by another, and every one by his neighbor, and the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. What Isaiah is saying here, this is upside down. It's not the way it should be. You see, for the child to assert himself over the ancient. In other words, instead of respecting his elders, it's the other way around. And it's interesting that as we look at our society today, whatever biblical yardstick you use, we're in bad shape. There's two measures that come to mind. This one, for an example, the, the rebellion and the dominance economically. If you're a, a, a consumer merchandiser, you know that the young market is where the action is, right? The kids have the money to spend. And the other yardstick, of course, is homosexuality. It's classically all through the Bible been a measure of the degradation of a society. Verse 6, when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler. Let this ruin be under thy hand. And that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. To show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin like Sodom. They hide it not. 
And here again is this expression, drawing a comparison to Jerusalem and Sodom, using Sodom as a spiritual low. Woe unto their soul. This is the first of eight woes. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say to the righteous, that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with them, for the reward of his hand shall be given them. As for my people, children are their oppressors, women rule over them. I'm not going to comment on that one with a ten-foot pole, I'll let it speak for itself. O my people, they who lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and their princes, for ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. And he continues in his vein, he's just pronouncing judgment upon Judah and Jerusalem. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling anklets, and their headbands and their crescents like the moon, the pendants and the bracelets and the veils and the headdresses and the armlets and the sashes and the perfume boxes and the amulets, the rings and the nose rings. There's one you're probably not guilty of, girls. The festival robes and the mantles and the cloaks and the handbags and the hand mirrors and the linen wrappers and the turbans and the veils. Sounds like Isaiah dumped one of the purses open. Huh? Every time I go through something like this, I'm reminded of the Greek word. In the, this is Old, Old Testament, Hebrew, but in the Greek, the word cosmos is the word that means to bring order out of chaos. And it's the same root that we get the word cosmetics. So I just had to point that out. Vanity, vanity, vanity. And Isaiah, of course, is dealing in the idiom of that day. But in this sophisticated audience, it doesn't take any commentary or amplification to apply this to today. It shall come to pass that instead of the sweet fragrance, there shall be rottenness, and instead of a girdle, a rope, and instead of a well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a robe, the girdling of sackcloth, and the branding instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she, being desolate, shall sit upon the ground." Isaiah calling their attention that their vanity, their, their aspirations are going to be brought to naught, that they're heading for judgment. On the one hand, we're primarily interested in how it might apply to us. On the other hand, I want to keep some historical perspective here. Isaiah is writing at a time just prior to, but about the time that the northern kingdom, Israel, is going into captivity. The Assyrians are dominant in about 722 B.C. They take captive the northern, the simple we call Samaria, the northern kingdom, or called Israel. Isaiah is preaching and pushing and prophesying on Jerusalem and Judah, the southern kingdom. By the time we get to chapter 13, Isaiah is going to be talking about not only the captivity that Judah is about to inherit with Babylon, but even goes so far to dis describe the destruction of Babylon. And when we get into Isaiah 13 and 14, we'll, be, we'll get into all that. What's interesting is Isaiah will be prophesying the fall of Babylon before Babylon's even an empire. At the time he's writing, Assyria's now the heavies. Babylon's a little city state that's a pawn of Assyrian politics. And it's a hundred years later, after the fall of Assyria, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar rises to power. And uh, Isaiah will write about Nebuchadnezzar's fall long before he's even risen, which must have made his writings bizarre to his readers at the time, in some respects. But okay, we got to chapter 4. The context is pretty straightforward. There's obviously a very clear, direct, local application by Isaiah to his people, to Jerusalem. Bear in mind, Isaiah now is a friend of the king, probably his cousin. Uh, he was intimate with the high priest. He's a man of rank. He's very eloquent, has the largest vocabulary of the prophets. Almost 2,200 words, the different words used in the book of Isaiah. But his focus is Jerusalem. He's the court preacher. He's speaking against Judah and Jerusalem. That's his focus. 
but obviously being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And also, obviously, as we read this from time to time, the shoe pinches pretty bad. And the shoe, you know, the old expression. Right? So it fits, and we should uh, take that to heart. There is a short chapter. We have six verses, chapter 4. And that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now, this has, obviously, a local application, probably. <laughs> but as you know, I'm a mystic. And uh, you'd be disappointed in the Chuck Mister Bible study if I don't move out to left field now and then. And at the same time, this is the kind of thing that you either see or you don't. And if this bothers you, don't worry about it. But I, in chapter 4, verse 1, I'm fascinated by the fact we see these seven women. What's in the back of my mind, for some reason are the seven letters to seven churches and the seven kingdom parables. And it's interesting that that day seven women shall take hold of one man. Who's the man? Jesus Christ, maybe. But what he's saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name. And I can't help but hear echoes of Sardis and what have you, where they are Christian in name only. And uh, instead of eating the bread of life, and instead of putting on his righteousness, these women are eating their own bread and wearing their own apparel. Remember the wedding guest that didn't have the apparel provided by the host, he brought his own. Remember what happened to him. And so uh, it's interesting, but they want to still be called by thy name to take away our reproach. And if my analogy is correct, he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Possible. It's just a hint. It may be just coincidental, really. So verse 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord. Now here we have this wonderful name, the branch, the netzer. It's interesting. There are 20 different Hebrew words that can mean branch, but there's one word that's used several times in the Old Testament, meaning the Messiah. There's a play on Hebrew words. The netzer is also the derivative from which he's called a Nazarene means the branch, the root of David. It's the title of Jesus Christ. In that day shall the branch of the Lord. And if you're familiar with Old Testament idioms, you know that that's a prophetic allusion to none other than the Messiah of Israel. That day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and splendid for those who are escaped of Israel. Really. Another dominant theme throughout Isaiah will be the remnant. That small minority of Israel that will not be deceived by the coming leader. There's a coming world leader that is going to be accepted by Israel as their Messiah. In John 5, 43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name and him you will receive. We call this guy the Antichrist. That's unfortunate because it's a myopic term. The word Antichrist really means instead of Christ. Pseudo-Christ. He is obviously against Christ, but that what the word originally meant in the Greek is something else. Of the uh, 50 titles of him in the uh, Bible, we've picked the one that is very narrow in its con- conception. This coming world leader is not just anti-Christ. He's anti-anything that's worshipped. Puts himself ahead of that. But in his initial stages, he's a peacemaker. He's the greatest problem solver the world's ever seen. He's charismatic, creative, and he solves problems no one else can. And he'll be embraced by the world as Mr. Neat guy. And Israel will accept him as the Messiah, which probably means he's Jewish. And yet he also may be, if you have to do some eschatology of Islam, he will also probably be accepted by Islam as their Messiah. And that's going to cause some interesting aspects. And that may be explained why, how, and where the temple will be built. There will be a small number, a remnant of Israel, that will recognize him for what he is and try to escape his influence, although it's with great difficulty because he will ultimately control the political economic, and religious systems of the world. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass that who is left in Zion, and he who remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, and every one that is, is uh, written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and have purged the blood of Jerusalem from its midst by the spirit of justice and by the spirit of burning. Burning in the sense of a judgment of sin. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of flaming fire by night. And upon all the glory shall be a defense. 
What an interesting idiom. That phrase, of course, speaks of the Shekinah glory, the same manifestation that, first of all, uh, dealt with Israel when they were called out of Egypt, when they were born in effect as a nation. The pillar of fire by night and cloud by day that uh, thwarted Ewell Brenner and his bunch, if you recall, speaking of the idiom of the famous movie. It's also the Shekinah glory that actually dwelt between the cherubim and the tabernacle. It's the Shekinah glory that filled Solomon's temple. And Ezekiel describes the great pain, it's leaving Solomon's temple when it was over. This was the Shekinah glory that did not inhabit Herod's temple. Why? Because one glory greater than the temple was there, namely Jesus Christ. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. A brief vision in chapter 4. Now, in chapter 5, we have an idiom of the vineyard. Now, I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. A well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he dug it and gathered out the stones and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a winepress in it. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more in my vineyard that I have not done to it? Why, when I looked for it to bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? In other words, undesirable. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be eaten up and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Gee, what's he talking about? He explains it in verse 7, in case you're not following him. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is what? The house of Israel. Not the nation Israel, the house of Israel, as opposed to the house of Judah. Right? What's the symbol of the house of Israel? The vineyard. What's the symbol of the house of Judah? Fig tree. Run with that one, if you follow me. We'll get to that later. Vineyard the house of, Israel, of the Lord is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah is pleasant plant. You see, the, he's, he's including both in his prophecy, but the, the symbolism is, is denotative. And look for justice, and behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. In your notes, you might want to take a look at the first 26 verses of Romans chapter 11. We won't write now, but in your notes for your own homework assignment, ancillary reading, Romans 11, first 26 verses. But there is a parable. It's interesting how some parables are in one gospel, some are two, some are three, some are even four. The parable of the vineyard is in three places, Matthew 21, verses 33 to 41, Mark chapter 12, first nine verses, and Luke 20, verses 9 to 19. We'll pick up any one of these. Let's take Matthew 21. Since it's in three Gospels, it's probably pretty important. Well, it's all important, but we do get the sense that there must be something particularly important when it's that often. Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder who planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dug a winepress in it and built a tower and leased it to a tent of farmers and went into a far country. And when the time of his fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the farmers that they might receive the fruits of it. And the farmers took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Rough bunch. Ungrateful bunch of brutes, aren't they? Be careful, that's you and I, in effect. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. And by the way, the Mark 12 verse says his beloved son. So in case you're not following <laughs> the analogy. Verse 38, But when the farmers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do? <laughs> what will he do to those farmers, if you were the owner of the property? 
You sent your servants again and again, they get slaughtered or beat up. You finally send your own son, expecting they'll certainly reverence him, and they kill him. You're going to get pretty upset? That's the point. See, the whole issue in the Bible, the whole reason you study the Bible is for perhaps a, a reason you may not have thought about. And I'll use a, as an example the book of Job. Everybody tells you the issue in the book of Job is why do the innocent suffer? That's not what the book of Job is. If that's the issue, it never gets answered. What's the book of Job really all about? Getting the divine viewpoint. As we watch Job, we have the benefit of the dialogue between him and Satan. So we can see the scene from God's point of view, right? That's true of the entire Bible. Part of what we're trying to do, what God would have us do, is understand our existence from his point of view. And that's what we're getting here. What's the point of view of this situation from the point of view of the owner of the vineyard? Is he going to have a justification to draw a sword and get at it? Certainly be justified, wouldn't he? Verse 41, they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will lease his vineyard to other farmers who shall render him the fruits of in their seasons. And Jesus said to him, Did ye never read the Scriptures, that the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It's interesting, we always think of vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and we always quote that in the sense that it ain't our prerogative, it's his, right? In other words, we should never take vengeance. That's the Lord's prerogative. We always talk about that. Romans talks about it, quotes from the Old Testament. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Turn that coin over. Vengeance is his, and he will take it. That's part of what Isaiah will be talking about. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of it. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, and on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You have two choices, to fall on the stone or have it fall on you. Which is it? And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard these parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. <laughs> no kidding, Dick Tracy. Anyway, let's overshoot and go to Psalm, Psalm 80. Psalm 80. We'll just stick in a psalm here because it fits. Psalm 80, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, who dwelleth between the cherubim, shine forth. Who dwelleth between the cherubim. What does that mean? Who dwelleth between the cherubim? God does. Which cherubim is he talking about? It says between implies two. It means the tabernacle. Who dwells between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant? God did in the tabernacle. Before Ephraim and Benjamin, Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and restore us. Restore, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the nations and planted it. Thou preparedest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and fill the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it and the boughs thereof were like goodly cedars. She sent out her boughs into the sea and her branches into the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges so that all they who pass by do pluck her? The boar out of the forest doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven, and behold, and visit this vine, and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted. Who? Who planted the vineyard? Who is the right hand of God? Jesus Christ. This is in the Psalms, 800 years before Christ was born. And the branch thou madest strong for thyself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. The reason I'm showing you this isn't just to make the point about the vine. Do you notice how the Holy Spirit, using the same idioms by David in the Psalms, by Isaiah the prophet, and in the New Testament, right? So when you are in John 15 and Jesus says, I am the vine and ye are the branches, it has more meaning to it. It's a whole different perspective, isn't it? Notice the next verse, verse 17 of Psalm 80. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, and upon the Son of Man, whom thou madest strong for thyself. That's in the Psalms. is that interesting? So we will not go back from thee, revive us, so that we will call upon thy name, restore us, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we will be saved. Okay, back to Isaiah. We got down to chapter 5, verse 7. We'll continue some more woes here. We've got six more coming. <laughs> Verse 8, Woe unto them who join house to house, who lay field to field, till there is no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. 
Verse 9, In mine ears said the Lord of hosts of truth, the many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a seed of an omer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them who rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them. I won't ask for a show of hands. I'll just let you uh, think about that on your own. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Why? Because they have no knowledge. Gee, that's not fair. Who said fair? Can you get injured? Can you be hurt by being uninformed? You bet. What's the remedy? Get informed. Learn his word. Find out what God requires. Look at life the way he sees it. Get the divine viewpoint. Therefore, Sheol hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in justice, and God who is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. See the consistent theme. The pride of the wicked will be brought down, and the humble in the Lord will be exalted. Verse 17, then shall the lambs feed after their manner in the waste places, the fat ones shall sojourners eat. Woe unto them who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were a cart rope. It's interesting how sin loves company. It's interesting how sin draws you in. A little bit leads to more. You can build on that yourself. You get the flavor of it. Verse 19, let's say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near, come, that we may know it. There again, another one of these 25 occasions when Isaiah uses this unusual title, the Holy One of Israel. Woe unto them who call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Wow! Does that summarize the theology, the philosophy of our world today. Value relativism. We don't speak of good and evil. We speak of a set of values. They have their values. We have ours. It's in a pursuit of tolerance and, and uh, social peace, we deal in value systems. It's the jargonese of today, but it leads to that insidious thing called value relativism. And if any of you have uh, an interest in this or have not read Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, interesting book, interesting book, the ellipsis that has occurred on our campuses over the years in our pursuit of openness. We've uh, embraced value relativism, the denial of absolutes, not realizing that once you do that, that also implies that there's nothing to learn from history, because all things are relative. That means the historic classical roots of Western civilization have nothing to offer. There are no answers, so why search for answers? And that whole system has caused our graduates and our colleges to have closed minds. They don't know the great books. They don't know the Western. Even, in, even just arguing in secular terms. It's interesting that Alan Bloom points out how our society is decaying and coming apart because of the, our denial of absolutes. And you're not dealing from a theological basis at least not evidently in his book. But it's interesting, the, the Closing of the American Mind. Must reading if you have a sensitivity in this area. Woe unto them who call evil good and good evil. Boy, does that characterize our value system. Who put darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 19, for as written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and the Gentiles foolishness, but unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. What a strange phrase, the foolishness of God. How can you even put that in one sentence? God is foolish, and yet that's what Paul is saying, the foolishness of God. 
And you can go through the whole scripture and notice how God seems to reach out to use foolish things to humble man. All the way through. He decides to wipe out the earth, save eight people, by building a boat. That's pretty weird, Ian, really. Samson destroys the Philistines with what? The jawbone of an ass. You go right through, all the way through. You've got um, uh, a name in the Syrian general going to Elisha to be saved. Go and be washed in the mighty river seven times. You've got to be kidding. God uses that. All the way through. As you read the Bible, you, you can just be sent, you just sense that God's often, frequently, almost always, uses strange mechanics. The foolishness of God. What's the ultimate absurdity? The ultimate foolishness that the entire cosmos is going to be judged and measured and related to a Roman cross on a hill in Judea 1900 years ago? That mankind will be measured, judged, and dealt with on the basis of their relationship to one hanging on that cross. You see, that's what verse 18 says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To whom is it foolish? To them that perish. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. The foolishness of God. Verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. For God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised with God chosen. Yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Why? So that no flesh should glory in his presence. Anyway, back to Isaiah. Down to verse 22. Woe unto them who are mighty and drink wine, the men of strength who mix strong drink, who justify the wicked for reward, who take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, as the flame consumed with the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust, and because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, as the anger of the Lord kindled against this people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were, were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He will lift up an ensign, to the nations from far, and he will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed, swift. And he's actually referring to the Assyrians. The Assyrians are going to take away the northern kingdom, the Babylonians, and later the southern kingdom. None shall be weary or stumble among them, none shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' hoofs shall be carted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind, their roaring shall be like a lion, and their roar shall like young lions, yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safely, and none shall deliver it. In that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look into the land, behold, darkness and sorrow and light is darkened in the heavens thereof. That's Isaiah calling the shots that are coming where the Lord is going to judge his people that have disintegrated. The northern kingdom in its way, but specifically here focusing on the southern kingdom. That leads us to chapter 6. In chapter 6, uh, is not necessarily, by the way, in chronological order. What happens in chapter 6 could have happened earlier, but here Isaiah takes occasion to recount it. King Uzziah intruded upon the priest's office, got leprosy, and died. Sad situation. And Isaiah says here, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Brief little verse. Boy, is there a lot in here. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. We'll take this occasion to take a look at a few other places where the writer is treated to a perception, a vision, an insight into the throne of the Almighty God, the creator of the universe. We glibly talk about that, and we'll see in the idioms here, but before we jump into that, let's stop and think for a minute how glibly that phrase is, and yet how awkward that is. Because remember now, God is not living in three dimensions. We are. All we know are three dimensions. Three and a half, really, if you count time. Time isn't a full dimension. We can only go in one direction. 
you move forward and look back, you can't look forward or move back, right? I get some black stairs. How many remember tomorrow? Okay. Oh, yeah, we'll talk later, yeah. See, we really, in, that, in a sense of speaking, time is nonlinear and time is... A, so the point, but let's set that issue aside. We'll get to three or four dimensions. The point is you and I are no height with left and breadth. I mean, that's it, right? We're three dimensions. And God is not limited to three dimensions. From particle physics, we know he lives in at least 11. And it's naive and foolish to limit him to those. I happen to believe that he lives in a Hilbert space, which a mathematician will describe as a, it has an infinite number of dimensions. That makes more sense to me somehow. As we tread this ground, let's do so cautiously, because recognize we're going to move into hyperspace. We're moving into something more than three dimensions. So Isaiah says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train. Now, the word in the Hebrew is shul. It says train here. A, that's equivalent to the word hem. And this is one of those places that I would encourage you, just to, to show you how it can be fruitful, to do a word study on these things. The Greek word, or the Hebrew word is shul. It means hem, border, fringe, the bottom edge of a skirt or train, right? Now, in the ancient world, to cut off the hem was to strip one of his personality and authority and so forth. The husband could divorce his wife by cutting off the hem of her robe in the old, in the old cultures. A nobleman could authenticate his name on a clay tablet by pressing his particular hem on the clay tablet. It was like a signature. It's like a seal. This gives us a new insight when David cuts the hem of Saul's garment in the cave. Remember when he's sleeping, he cuts off, he cut the hem of it because he cut off his genealogy that was embroidered in the hem. That was a symbol of kingship. And that's why David later repented of that. Okay? God, he was conscious stricken. That's all the first thing in the 24th when we looked that up. The fringes on the Levitical garments in ancient Israel, Numbers 15, Deuteronomy 22, uh, Exodus 28. God's covenant with Israel, God says in Ezekiel 16, in Exodus 39, I will spread my shul over thee. That was his way of putting his authority, his, his mantle, his protection, his covering on Israel. Joseph's coat of many colors. It wasn't many colors. It was a seamless robe with a special hymn, which implied a, a position of privilege. Jesus' seamless robe that was never torn. The temple veil was torn. Jesus' robe was not. They gambled for it. Remember? They wouldn't tear it. The Roman soldier didn't know why. It was because his priesthood is without end. Remember when the woman with an issue of blood wanted to touch the hem of his garment? Why the hem of his garment? Because that's where conceptually was his authority. He was on his way to Jairus, the Jewish daughter, to save her. The woman had to be a Gentile because she had an issue of blood. If it was Jewish, she wouldn't be in the group trying to get through. So was, and they're both 12, she had an issue of blood 12 years. Jairus' daughter was how old? The Holy Spirit ties that together for you so you don't miss the allegorical implication. Jesus, on his way to save Israel... By faith saves the Gentile woman. You've been through that. That's by way of review. Ruth and Boaz. Remember when Ruth, the Gentile ultimate bride-to-be of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, asked him to put his hymn over her. Now, she's not propositioning him in the middle of the night. He, she's putting the claim of the Leverite marriage on him. And he accepts. If he can solve the other problem, and you know the story of Ruth, if not dig into it. And that's just a little background. And here in Isaiah chapter 6, we have the shul again, fill the temple. Verse 2, and above it stood the seraphim, whatever they are. Each one had six wings. That's interesting. We'll discover the chariot. Them also have six wings. Scholars are divided. This is the only place the word seraphim appears. Some scholars believe the seraphim and the cherubim are just two words for the same creature. And I lean that way, but I wouldn't insist on it. And yet we'll also notice there are some differences. But whether those differences are discriminatory or not, we're not sure. Above, stood the, above what? Above the temple. Stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. Two covered his face, two covered his feet, and two, with two he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The, the, the cherubim are also, we'll notice when we need to look them up, also continually proclaiming and protecting and exerting his holiness. Holy, holy, holy. Why three holies? Trinity? Interesting, huh? The post of the door moved with the voice of him who cried, the house is filled with smoke. Notice Isaiah's reaction. And it's universal. Same thing's true of Daniel, same thing's true of John. When, he see, when confronted with the throne of God, what is the response? Excitement? Elation? Joy? No. 
Isaiah said, then I said, I, woe is me. Why? For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The reaction of Isaiah when he sees the throne of God is to be crushed with the consciousness of the gap between the righteousness of God and his own sinfulness. God deals with that. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. We know from Leviticus chapter 6, the altar was always burning, never allowed to go out. That live coal is touched on his lips. I'm nice speaking idiomatically here, I'm sure, but nevertheless, the point is, um, he laid it upon my mouth and he said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Praise God. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Notice the us. That's plural. God says, Whom shall I send? It's not like Moses where he says, Hey, I'm going to send you. Not a command. It's a question. Hey, who will go? Jeremiah says, I'm too young. Moses says, I'm a stammering lips and of a slow tongue, right? What does Isaiah say? Got his hand up. Send me. I'm ready. Then said I, here am I, send me. That's our kind of guy, isn't it? The throne of God. We might take a quick look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 2. About verse 5 in chapter 1, and out of the midst of it, that is, there came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Every one had four faces. Every one had four wings. Their feet were straight feet, and the sole of the feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled with the color of burnished bronze. And they had the hands of a man under their wings and the four sides, and the four had faces like their wings. And their wings were joined one to another. And they turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. I'm not going to get into a whole Ezekiel vision here, but notice verse 10. As for their likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion. On the right side, the four had the face of an ox. On the left side, and the, they four also had the face of an eagle. There are four faces mentioned here, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Rather weird, isn't it? The four-faced thing. And the more you read this vision, I'll let you go. Then there's also all the way through here, down verse 13, there's the coals of fire. There's lots of parallels. I'll let you study the parallels. So pop over to Ezekiel chapter 10. We have a vision of God's glory. And verse 2, you have the coals of fire again between the cherubim, which is an interesting parallel. You can go through this on your own. They also had four faces in verse 14. Except we don't have one of a man. We have our ox, we have a cherub, whatever that is. A face like a face of a man, a lion, and an eagle whatever that means. So we can go on here. But again, verse 21, four faces apiece, four wings, and so on. Daniel chapter 7, you can put in your notes, will, in the interest of time, pop right over to Revelation 4. John is again, like the others, treated to a vision of the throne of God. The seven letters, seven churches are now behind us. We go to Manitoba, verse chapter 4, verse 1. And look, behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice I heard was, it, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, come up here, and so on. Verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. By the way, the full of eyes is also the Old Testament. Even I forgot to pull that out. The first living creature was like a lion. The second like a, the li living creature was like a calf, or an ox, if you will. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings. That's like Isaiah, isn't it? About him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not. They are not saying, holy, holy, holy. There's the three holies again. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when these living creatures give glory and honor, and thanks to him who is seated on the throne and liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that is seated upon the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast down their thrones, above, and so on it goes. 24, it's interesting. One thing I was going to ask as a question, I'll just give you the answer. If you notice the Old Testament, between Ezekiel and Isaiah and Daniel and uh, Revelation, you'll see a lot of similarities, some differences, especially Daniel 7 and the and Ancient of Days and all that's very similar to Revelation 4. But there's one thing that occurs only in the New Testament. That's the 24 elders. They're, in, they're invisible in the Old Testament. 
And there's lots of other reasons why most scholars lean to the idea that those 24 elders who represent, the only place 24 occurs is the priesthood and 24 courses. They are kings and priests, and the only people who are kings and priests are the church. And so many scholars, not all, but many scholars ascribe to the 24 elders the church. And what's interesting is the church is not in the Old Testament according to Ephesians 3, and it's interesting that the 24 elders are invisible in, in, the, in the visions of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah which tend to, not a proof, but it tends to be seen that way. What I'd like to do, I'd like to share with you a few th possibilities about the throne of God, and it's easier to do with uh, graphics. We'll start by talking a little bit about the tabernacle. These are in feet here to give you a rough perspective. It hangs on how big a cubit is. A cubit was somewhere between 14 and 25 inches, depending on what authorities. We generally treat it as about 18 inches. And if so, the tabernacle was a a, an enclosure about 75 feet on the side and 150 feet long, inside of which, as you enter the one gate, Jesus made a the, Everything in the tabernacle, every detail, speaks of the person of Jesus Christ. I am the door. Anyone that comes out in the other way is a thief and a robber. The brazen altar is the place of sacrifice. The brazen altar sacrifice. After you sacrificed, you washed in the laver. The laver represents the Word of God. Now we are clean through the washing of the water by the Word. You're washed two ways. You're washed once judicially. It's interesting that in, in, we presently are washed by the Word. In Revelation, we see the glassy sea where there's, the saints are standing on it. So the, the Holy Spirit's dealing with the pun. Here we wash out there. We stand on it. In either case, it's the Word of God. But as you go forward to the tabernacle proper, that's this portable building made of vertical planks that were made of acacia wood wrapped with gold and then, and then uh, horizontal poles giving it rigidity. You have roughly a 15 by 45 foot portable building covered with four different coats of things. We won't get into that here. As you entered this, if you were a priest on the right, you saw the table of showbread, two piles, six each. That's 12 loaves of bread changed every Shabbat. On the left, you had the, it says candlestick. That's unfortunate. I meant to put a uh, lampstand, but the menorah, the, uh, the oil sor uh, lit, uh, source of illumination, built of a solid piece of gold, a main branch, and say, I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus says. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life, and so on. The altar of incense. The altar of incense, that's a, about a three-foot-high thing that they burn incense. Incense was analogous or spoke of prayers, prayers of intercession. And it's also kind of interesting that when Elijah, there's a legend when Elijah uh, was translated, his mantle, his cloak, his power and authority to, uh, deferred to Elisha. And Elisha, of course, uh, had his mantle. When Elisha died, we understand that the mantle uh, was put in the, uh, stored inside of this three-foot-high appliance called the uh, Golden Altar. We also know, interestingly enough, the one link I've been able to establish on this strange legend I'm tracking down is that the Golden Altar was available in Herod's Temple. The Ark of the Covenant was, but the Golden Altar was, interestingly enough. When Zechariah is officiating as a priest, we discover that, of course, he was in the holy place. And uh, the story is, is that he was instructed and did take the mantle of Elijah out of the altar of incense, and the story would have it that John the Baptist was wearing the mantle of Elijah, which puts a whole different complexion on the statement that Jesus Christ says that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He actually was wearing Elijah's mantle. That's why when in John chapter 2, is it 2 or 1 anyway, when chapter 2, when they, um, there was, he, was, he drew such a crowd that uh, the temple authorities had to send an inquisition to find out what was going on. Bear in mind, you know, that's a, a day's walk from Jerusalem to Jericho. And that is Jordan where John was baptized. That's a long way to go where the temple authorities were having attendance problems. Uh, they wanted to find out what's going on. That may be part of the reason. Anyway, the tabernacle speaks of the throne of God. Here's the, the Holy of Holies, the, the Ark of the Covenant. The lid had the two cherubim. God is spoken of as an idiom of God. He's spoken of he that dwelleth between the cherubims. The Shekinah glory actually entered. When Solomon dedicated his temple, the Shekinah glory entered the temple. The priests couldn't even get in there for a while. It was so... It's thick and, and heavy. So that's the guts. That's the center of the camp of Israel. Let's talk a little further about the camp of Israel. The tabernacle was at the center of the camp. And it, the opening of the tabernacle faced east. We had Moses and Aaron and the priests to the east side. Okay, to the south side, you had the Kohathites, then the Gershonites, then the Merites. These three families of the Levites had specific duties having to do with the tabernacle. And I'll come to that in a little bit. But the main point is, in the center, we had the tabernacle and the tribe of Levi, right? Around the camp, you had the 12 tribes. Now, right away, you need to, for those of you that may be new to this, I'll point out, how can you take the Levites out and still get 12? I thought there's 12 tribes. No, there's really 13. 
That's the rub. Ephraim and Manasseh together with the tribe of Joseph. So if you want 12, you can lump those two together and have 12 counting Levi. For the order of March and for certain, several other purposes, there's about 10 times the 12 tribes are listed in the Bible. Sometimes you count one, sometimes not. Sometimes you count Levi, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you count Dan. Sometimes, the point is, how can you always get 12? Well, because you can play games with Ephraim and Manasseh. You follow me? There's actually an alphabet of 13 to play with, if I may put it that way. Follow me? Okay. Now, the point I'm getting at is, is that when they camped, they grouped themselves, the 12 tribes grouped themselves in camps of three tribes each. The tribe of Judah, the tribe of Issachar, the tribe of Zebulun were instructed to camp together, and this collection of three tribes were to rally around the tribal standard of Judah, and they would camp here. Over to the west, we had Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, and they would rally around Reuben, and they were known collectively as the camp of Reuben. To the west, we had Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, and they would rally around the tribal standard of Joseph, or Ephraim, which was an ox. And to the north, we had Naphtali, Dan, and Asher. They were known as the camp of Dan, and they'd rally around, and it had different symbols. But at that one time, it would dominant one was an eagle. Now, what makes this provocative, if you, you're probably way ahead of me, is as you watch the camp of Israel assemble, and as they move through the wilderness, when they laid out, they put, set up the tabernacle, they'd mark out that space for the Levites, and then to the north, south, east, and west, these camps, groups of three tribes each, would encamp on the respective points of the compass. But they'd rally around a lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. And you don't have to be very mystical to sit back and say, whoa, what's going on here? They, either knowingly or unknowingly, I have no idea, when they were in camp as God instructed, they became, in some sense, a model, an allegory of the throne of God. Who is in the middle? The tabernacle, which speaks, of course, directly of Jesus Christ. By the way, the tabernacle itself rested on, that is, the buildings have rested on silver sockets. Silver, Levitically, speaks of blood, Right? The tabernacle rested on the blood of Christ. That's where you and I rest on the blood of Jesus. You, you say, gee, that's kind of like puns. Yes, it is. But I want you to be sensitive to just how far the Holy Spirit has gone to engineer this book, this Bible. Every detail, every number, every place name, every material, every subtlety in the text is there by design by the Holy Spirit. And every aspect of it speaks directly or indirectly on the person of Jesus Christ. The Word of God. That's, why he's, that's where John opens his gospel. That's what God calls him. The Word of God. The Word of God. In Christ. He became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory. We inspected his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Okay, you see, that's pretty interesting. First of all, you see why I bring this up with a vision of the throne of God so far. Okay? You say, gee, that's interesting. We have a cherubim with four faces, right? A lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle, right? Okay. We won't take too much time here on this one. But when we study the four Gospels, we're struck with the fact that they're very, they also are very specifically designed. Matthew was a Levi. His preoccupation was that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. He presents him as a Messiah. He starts his genealogy from Abraham. Why would he go any earlier as a Jew? and takes it through David and through the royal line, through Solomon down, through the legal line, down to Jesus Christ to show that he was heir to the throne of David. Okay. Now, Mark is interested in Jesus Christ as the servant. You don't care about the pedigree of a servant. Mark's the only gospel without a genealogy. There is a genealogy of sorts in John. I'll come to that. So the symbol, the classical symbol of, servant, of, of, of service is an ox, right? And he, his whole presentation is, is that way. That's the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Luke. Luke was a physician. He's in Christ's humanity. He starts with the first man, Adam. Takes his genealogy from Adam. Yes, he gets to David, but he takes a left turn. He didn't go through Solomon. He goes through Nathan. Why? Because he goes down the line that's Mary, the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Also the house of David, but not the royal line. Luke is the, interested in Jesus Christ as the son of man. What symbol would you use of Luke? The man. Starts his genealogy with Adam, the bloodline, and so forth. 
John's a totally different kind of guy. He presents Jesus Christ unabashedly as the Son of God, his deity. Simple the eagle, uh, his, his genealogy is the pre-existent one. The first three verses of the Gospel of John is a genealogy of a pre-existent human uh, person. Matthew talks about what Jesus said, Mark what he did, Luke what he felt, John who he was. Matthew wrote to the Jew, Mark the Roman, Luke the Greek, John to the church. It's interesting, the first miracle, leper cleansed, that to a Jew is deals with sin. To the Gentile, in both cases, Luke and Mark, it's uh, demon expelled. John, the water turned to wine. What a mystical way to begin. The end, uh, Ma Matthew, of course, being a Jew, ends with the resurrection. Mark, the ascension. Luke, the promise of the Spirit, because he leads right into Acts, volume 2 of the two-volume trial documents for Paul's defense in Rome that uh, Luke put together. And then John, we have the promise of his return, because he leads, of course, what? To Revelation. And on it goes, and you get into more of this sort of thing. I didn't want to get into the whole gospel story other than point out here again, it's not contrived to view these four dimensions, aspects of Jesus Christ presented by the gospels in quadraphonic, if I can use that term, as the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. Kind of interesting, isn't it? In Numbers chapter 2, of course, we, it mentions numbers. We got, I mean, it, it, they're literally numbered. Uh, we have the Levites and the three families. Remember the Merorites, Kohathites, Gershonites. So not many of those, six, 8,000 each, something like that. 6,200, 6,800, the numbers. 6,200 Demerites, 8,600 of uh, Kohathites, and 7,500 Gershonites. See, collectively speaking, they're small compared to the, these camps we're talking about, right? Well, they're going to be in the middle, aren't they? And by the way, the Merorites had responsibility for the structural components, the Kohathites, the internal equipment, and the Gershonites, the external covering. So these different families were allocated responsibility. When they took the tabernacle down, they took off, the Gershonites took off the external coverings, the Merorites took the structural components, the plane of the tabernacle proper and what have you, and the, and the limit and the, uh, the fence surrounded. And then, of course, the Goathites took the eternal equipment, the table of showbread and so forth. They left the Levites. But remember, we took the 12 tribes and organized them in four camps, right? When you go through Numbers chapter 2, it takes the trouble of telling you how many are in each tribe, right? When you read that, to pop back here just to refresh your memory, we have these... Various numbers, you know, Ephraim is 40,000, and Manasseh 32,200, and Judah 74,600. You know, you go through all these numbers, right? Issachar doesn't have many, 4,400. You, know, you get the numbers, okay? Now, I have this proposition that I want to challenge you with. My suggestion is there's nothing in the Scripture that's there by accident. Everything there holds somehow a secret to be discovered. Now, I'll be candid if you haven't discovered them all. I'm still at it. But... I've discovered enough to convince myself there's nothing trivial in the Scripture. Every number, every place name, and I'll speak idiomatically, every comma is there by design. We're going to discover that in Isaiah later. Well, when you look at these numbers, you can play with those all you like. It's hard to see much, right? But let's put two ideas together. We know that the, those tribes clustered in groups of three to make camps, and these are the numbers of the camps, right? You say, well, gee, that's very exciting, Chuck. What is that leading to? Well, let's take a look at this. That means the tabernacle is in the middle. To the, south, to the east, we have the lion of the tribe of Judah, Dan, ox, so forth, right? We're together. Got the eagle, ox, Ephraim, with 108,000, man, Reuben, 151. Now, what I want you to do with me in your mind's eye, your imagination, you and I are going to get aboard a, jet, uh, a Bell Jet Ranger, and we're going to pick up off the Sinai wilderness, and we're going to fly over the camp of Israel. And now, one other small point before I get into that. I'm going to argue, think like a rabbi. Let's take Judah. If Judah is going to camp east of the tabernacle, right, there is an area, probably square, that includes the tabernacle and the Levites. I've just represented that here by the square, right? If I'm due east of that, that's pretty obvious, I can camp as wide as that base is and consider myself east, right? If I move over to this region, right, you follow me? I'm northeast. If I move over here, I'm southeast, right? If I'm the eagle, Dan, to the north, I can be as long as I'm due north of the tabernacle, no problem. But if I move beyond the boundaries of the tabernacle, either east or west, I'm, you know, northwest or northeast, aren't I? You follow what I'm saying? 
Well, with that in mind, I'm going to lift up on this jet ranger. We're going to fly over the Sinai Desert. And we're going to fly over the camp of Israel. What we're going to do, you and I, we're going to arrange our approach that we're going to come in to the camp of Israel from the east. And if we realize that these are constrained by whatever the dimension of the tabernacle, their length will be proportional to the size of those camps, which means that the shortest one is Ephraim, right, to the west. The longest one, 186,000 to 108, is Judah. Both Reuben, the camp of Reuben, the camp of Dan, are essentially 150,000 each. And the interesting thing is God looked down on the Sinai if they were assembled properly, according to his word, he looked down upon a cross. That blow you away? That blew me away when I first perceived that, and I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm quite serious about it. See, for these guys to spread themselves in these other areas, they no longer are, are complying to the requirements of the Torah in Numbers 2 and 10. Follow me? And so that's what you come up with. has to be. Can you imagine? I can't imagine my wildest dreams that's that a rabbinical scholar of the Torah would bring that out. This proves, con this proves conclusively that the book of Numbers was written after the New Testament. <laughs> and of course, obviously, I'm being facetious. The throne of God. When Israel followed the instructions that God gave him the Torah, he could look down not just at the tabernacle representing in all its symbolism the person, work, and uh, mission of Jesus Christ and his great redemptive work on your behalf and mine. More than that, we see the 12 tribes modeling, if you will, the throne of God with the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle as represented in these bizarre idioms that we see uh, in Isaiah 6 and uh, Ezekiel 1 and 10 and Revelation 4, etc. But more than that, when we, Im we include the numbers listed in the book of Numbers. By the way, these are very understated because the only record, record men, uh, uh, what is it, 20 years and older that go to war, it doesn't include women and children and the rest. So the actual numbers are much, much larger. Uh, we're not talking, you know, we're talking uh, probably over a million people. And so these arms are pretty substantial. I, I have no idea what the what allocation of space is for the tabernacle of the Levites, but whatever it is, it isn't that large because there weren't that many. It's one tribe's worth, right? At most, I mean, you can go through the numbers yourself. But whatever square it is, that has to be amplified. And whenever these numbers are, that's the proportion of the various wings of the, of the camp. And whenever God looked down, he saw in one glance his whole redemptive plan. But I think that's kind of wild. And that just leads me to the, the, the main conclusion that God's greatest work, his greatest achievement, is not the creation. How do I say that? Well, first of all, I can tell how important something is by how much space is devoted in the Bible. The creation has a couple of chapters in Genesis. It's got a couple of chapters in Job. It's got actually a chapter or two in Isaiah, a few Psalms. And by and large, that's about it, Yang. Well, let's talk about the redemption that God has done. Well, gee, most of Genesis, you know, Abraham calling away, all that stuff, that's all the redemption. Certainly the whole book of Exodus is the book of redemption, Passover, all of that. Book of Leviticus has all the detail, every ordinance, every offering, all those tedious ordinances, all speak of God's redemptive concept and his plan. Well, that's Leviticus, okay. Numbers, Deuteronomy, wilderness, wandering. Well, gee, yeah, on, on it goes, right? Certainly most of the Psalms, redemption. The prophets, boy, all the prophets. You get to the New Testament. Well, <laughs> the gospel, sure. And the epistle, wait a minute. Whole book is about the redemption. How much space is creation? Half a dozen chapters. How much redemption? Most of the book. There's another way to measure importance. What did the creation cost God? He called it into existence, breathed it with the breath of his nostrils. Our equivalent expression might be he snapped his fingers is there, right? If you're a student of the creation, you wonder why did he have to take six days? Another way to measure importance is what did it cost him? Let's talk about the redemption. What did the redemption cost God? More than you and I have any capacity of appreciating. Glibly, we say it cost him his son, Jesus Christ. There are aspects of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ gave up, apparently, for eternity. And we'll find out more about the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah than you have any idea. We'll get there in good, good time. The God of the universe not only created the universe, not, I don't mean just matter and energy, I mean time and space, called it into existence. 
We call it the Big Bang. We're now discovering that we can measure it. It had a beginning. Scientists acknowledge that. And God has revealed himself in the creation, even to our secular scientists today. Scientists today. Anyone that still uh, believes in evolution is just uninformed scientifically. So God, the creator of the universe, anticipated the predicament that you and I would be in because he wants fellowship with you and I, but he knew that there would be a, an incredible gap between us called sin. We have a sin problem. And the lengths to which he has gone to take care of the sin problem for the asking. In fact, the biggest problem we have is we find it difficult to accept the fact that he's done 100% of the job. He needs nothing from us other than our accepting it. In fact, he insists that he not be paid wages. If we contribute to it, then it's wages. If, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's, he insists that it's a gift. He's done 100% of the job. His, he's got a destiny for you and I that goes beyond our imagining, and it's there for the asking. And he demonstrates this by giving us a message system, 66 books written by 40 authors or assembled over thousands of years, in which every detail, every word, every place name, every subtlety of design, from Genesis 1 from to Revelation 22, is there engineered skillfully, carefully, precisely, mysteriously by a supernatural agency that we glibly call the Holy Spirit. And every day we go by, every time we turn a page, every time we do a little digging, we discover another treasure, another secret, another insight to realize that he has thought this all through from before the world began. When did God first start dealing with you? Ephesians 1, 4 says, before the foundation of the world. That's when he started dealing with you and me, personally, individually. He knew the end from the beginning. And he demonstrates that every page we go, that his redemptive plan, this, this strange, bizarre pattern that God has laid out for himself of redeeming you and I by the shed blood of his son on a cross, on a Roman cross, 1900 years ago, that God, by that cross, will judge the universe, judge the world, and we will be divided. And it won't be what you've done, good or bad. It'll be as your name written in a book. You'll go up there and someone will say, name, please. And is it in there? Yes or no? If it is, you've got no problems. He's taken care of it, all of it. Oh, sure, there's rewards if you've been you've done done well and so forth. There are, there are opportunities, yes, but you're either in the book or not because he either knows you or he doesn't. You either know him or you don't. You've either fallen on the stone or it'll crush you. Because when it says name, please, and your name isn't there, hey, it's over. You've had your chance. It's, I want to see your boss. Oh, it's too late. He was with you. Interesting. 